My wife said that she found a really good recipe for chili. She told me that it only calls for 239 beans. I asked her, why such a precise number of beans? And she said, because if it had just one more, it would be too farty. Today, I am excited to introduce our ever-expanding line of ready-to-eat chilies and stews. As someone who is passionate about the power of whole food, plant-based nutrition, I understand how important it is to have convenient and nutritious meal options that align with our values. That's why I've worked super hard with my team to develop a line of hearty and delicious chilies and stews that are made from whole plant-based ingredients and are ready to eat in just minutes. Our chilies and stews are packed with wholesome ingredients like beans, but not 239, vegetables and grains, and are free from added oils, refined sugars, excessive sodium, and processed ingredients. They're absolutely perfect for those super busy days when you need a quick and satisfying meal, or for those times when you're craving something warm and comforting. Whether you're a student looking for a quick and easy lunch or a busy parent in need of a healthy and convenient dinner option or anything in between, our ready-to-eat chilies and stews are the perfect solution. So join us on the Plant Strong journey and experience the strong benefits of a whole food, plant-based lifestyle. Order a sample pack of our five ready-to-eat chilies and stews today and let me know how much you love them. Learn more at plantstrongfoods.com. He said, what credit do you give your food? And I said, 95%. (laughs) Uh, I have hiked all those marathons, run all those marathons, biked across the U.S., all these things, despite how my body felt. My hips hurt since I was in my 40s. My hips always hurt. And now I do these things because of how my body feels. I'm Rip Esselstyn, and welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. The mission at Plant Strong is to further the advancement of all things within the plant-based movement. We advocate for the scientifically proven benefits of plant-based living and envision a world that universally understands, promotes, and prescribes plants as a solution to empowering your health, enhancing your performance, restoring the environment, and becoming better guardians to the animals we share this planet with. We welcome you wherever you are on your Plan Strong journey, and I hope that you enjoy the show. If there's one thing that I've learned in my 60 years on Earth, when Anne Kryle Esselstyn, that's my mom, tells you to do something, you do it. So of course, when she told me that I had to interview today's guest, I was on it. Ruth Morley is an adventurer. She's rarely at home in Cincinnati because she's usually found on a trail hiking. I'm talking about the Appalachian Trail, the Florida Trail, the Buckeye Trail, just to name a few. She's even ridden her bike 3,000 miles across the country and competed in many triathlons. Oh, and did I mention that Ruth, known by her trail name, Ruthless, is 70 years old and completely plant strong. She tells us exactly how she plans her food for these multi-week adventures, how she manages being a solar hiker and all the logistics that's involved, and of course, which equipment she prefers. It's a fun conversation. It's inspiring, informative, and downright motivational not just to do these super long hikes, but to do anything that is out of our comfort zones. And her slogan, make plans, not excuses. She is living the life that many of us wish we could. But as Ruth likes to say, you can choose your own adventures, even in your own backyard. You never know what's around the corner. So let's find out with Ruth, aka Ruthless Morley. Ruth Morley, welcome to the Plant Strong Podcast. It is such an honor to be here, Rip. Um, With all the lineup of previous guests you've had, I'm really flattered and very excited. This will be fun. Yeah, well, it will be a lot of fun. And, you know, the way that I came across you 
was <laughs> you were fortunate enough to have lunch with my parents, Ann and Essie, yeah. while I think you were maybe in the midst of hiking the Ohio Buckeye Trail. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And so you went over there for one of Ann's like stupendous lunches. What did you have? I think it was called San Francisco Stew, something like that. It yeah. was it was such a great feeling to sit at that table and think I can eat anything on this table. <laughs> it all passes the Esselstyn criteria. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now that was that was a thrill. Somehow I had heard that they lived somewhere near where I would be walking on the Buckeye Trail and I contacted them and she said, "Yeah, come for lunch." It's like, "What?" And then <laughs> She were sitting at the lunch table and somehow I think you FaceTimed her and she hands me the phone and says, here, Rip, talk to Ruth. She wants to be on your show. And I thought <laughs> I have one minute to sell myself. And here I am. And then after that, she said, Rip, you really should have Ruth on the podcast. She's oh. remar rem remarkable, remarkable oh. Ruth. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Well, but it, she, it, it, I look at her as a big sister I'm trying to emulate. Well, yeah, I, I try and emulate Anne every day as well. Mm -hmm. She's, yeah. She is remarkable. Uh, so tell me this, the Ohio Buckeye Trail, where was it that you, th can you remember where it was near my parents' house? Was it like the Chagrin River or what? Yes, it was right along the river. Uh, I had walked, I was going clockwise around it. I was heading northeast on it towards the um, headlands beach on lake erie and yeah chagrin river i believe was to the right and somehow in my stalking of them i found out it was close uh i just i have followed your father's diet for i'm in my fourth year now and i can't tell you how much i think of you and your family and all that you all do and how great it made me feel and i wanted to tell him in person wow and so what what led you to go down this path to try and find, you know, whole food, plant-based, my father, myself, and, you know, yeah. everybody, everybody else that's, you know, so spectacular in this space? Well, I figured you'd ask me that. This was almost a case of life imitating art because I was on my sofa with crutches due to double pelvic stress fractures in my in my pelvis from the Appalachian Trail. Uh, New Hampshire and Maine did a number on me. And can um, I stop you for I, a sec? I want to yeah. stop you for a sec because I have heard, you know, I had Scott Jurek on the oh, podcast yeah. after he set the speed record for the Appalachian Trail. And he said that that you like you said, Maine, New Hampshire is absolutely brutal. Brutal. Yeah. And so yeah. It sounds like your stress fractures are a testament to that. Yes. And it's sometimes there's hiking, but whenever I would find three to six feet of a dirt trail instead of jagged boulders I had to climb over, I would take a photo of them. It was, <laughs> look, there's a real trail here in Maine. It's not all boulders. So I was on the sofa with crutches that, you know, stress fractures on both sides of the pelvis and very discouraged, very depressed on antidepressant. You always get down when you come home from a big hike, but this was really bad. And I always think, is this, I'm a cat. Is this my ninth life? Am uh -huh. I going to finish? So I'm going through Netflix watching for things to f watch. And there's this picture of a bodybuilder and it says the game changers. Bada bing, it's done. It is done. I watch it. The next day I tell my husband, here's how I'm going to eat. And he is ever patient and understanding. And he said, okay, fine. And I had tried veganism before, but this was whole food plant-based eating. And it took me a while to learn how to do it. Uh, that was January of 2020. In March of that year, I went to Jane's conference for women on cancer uh, in Cleveland, in Chagrin Falls or Cleveland area. And that was just as COVID was, you know, ramping up. And yeah. that's when I really started to learn. And I bought this book and I bought your books, a book or one or two, and I plunged in. And when I do things, I have to admit, there's no tippy toeing around. I just make up my mind. I know it's the right thing. And I do it 100%. And that's what I did with his way of eating. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you had the stress fractures, 
how had you been eating for those years? Well, let's see. I think I was maybe about 68 years. So I started chewing at 67 years before. <laughs> it's the usual, it's the usual standard American diet. And I, and I was thinking the other day, what was my favorite food as a child? I think it was sugar. Honestly, I just think we had the Kool-Aid with the one cup of sugar per two, uh, two quarts or whatever those pictures are. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would make as a senior in high school, I'd get home early, I'd watch TV and I would make a grilled brown sugar and butter sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> it really, you know, I loved my grandmother's apple dumplings. It was, it was sugar. I was always very thin. And in my 20s and 30s, 30, 40s, I started marathons. I thought I was eating healthy. I used the good olive oil, uh, quote, good. Yeah, right. I ate lots of salmon. I'm sure salmon on ja uh, January 5th, 2020 was my last meat that I ever ate. Um, but I just didn't know all that oil. And I'd eat an avocado a day full of... Fine for some people, not for those with a family history that I have. And it's just going right in my arteries. And um, yeah, this really turned things around. So ironically, I did get off the crutches within two weeks. It didn't magically heal my bones. It me healed me up here. Yeah, I was holding myself back. I was so depressed. And I thought one day I can get by without these just a little bit. I'm going to wean myself off these crutches. Well, I weaned off within about an hour. And I just didn't need them. I knew that I was good. I'm not saying the bones healed overnight. I'm saying it helped me mentally. Yeah, yeah. And you had elevated cholesterol. What did your cholesterol do over a, a certain period of time? Um, I didn't keep strict records. I wish I'd kept a journal. But my cholesterol has been up to the 290s. And it has come down 100 points um, within... I would say it came down from about 270 to 220. Now, I do have the family history. I've been tested for it. My doctor is plant-based, yeah. and she's trained with your father. Um, it, I cannot get it below 190, uh, even though I eat 100% yeah. in accordance with your well, father. Well, and a lot of times, you know, that it's also important to recognize and know what are all fractions? So you may have a HDL that's 70, 80, or 90, and that almost makes it impossible for you to get down much lower because um, of that high uh, HDL. So mm -hmm. anyway, not, not, to, not to worry about that. And my father always likes to say, the most important thing, Ruth, is what is passing through your lips. Absolutely. Right? And I listen to him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I tried statin a little bit and I just didn't feel right with it. And I thought I am putting my money, I am betting on Esselstyn. <laughs> and, and I mean, my lifestyle, I do yoga, I meditate, I spend so much time in nature. I'm yeah. good. And if I die at 80, 10 years from now, it's been good. Yeah. You're but so it's not going to happen. So you, so you, <laughs> you are an adventure seeker. You love adventures uh, between the ages of 45 and, uh, or starting at age 45, I think you've, you've done like 46 marathons, six ultra marathons. Mm -hmm. What is it in you that has such a love for, you know, uh, adventures and now this ultra hiking? Yeah. You know, I don't know. I just want to know what's around the next corner. And my best friend who's six years older than me is exactly the same way on her bike. We want to know what's around the corner. It's a wonderful way to explore the world. I like challenging myself, but not, I try to find my limits. I, mm. especially as I get older, I've had osteopenia for years and then it edged into osteoporosis when I was on crutches, actually two times on crutches. Um, and now I edge back a little bit and the hips didn't appreciate the running. I don't do it anymore, but it was a good go when it lasted. I just want to point out one little quick thing with the osteoporosis, the way I, I don't make excuses. I make plans. And so I found online um, a Dr. Lauren Fishman who promotes a way of doing 
Yoga for Osteoporosis. And he has a book and he has a website and YouTube. And I found uh, on YouTube how to do 12 different poses of yoga, holding them for 30 seconds each at least four times a week. And I think when I have my DEXA scan in a couple months, it's going to show reversal of osteoporosis. I'm sure. Yeah. Well, and one of the best things, Ruth, and for all the listeners out there that you can do to help strengthen the bones uh, and kind of get those uh, osteoblasts humming is to do weight bearing exercise, which is what you're doing. Yeah. With right? the backpacks. Yep. Yeah. And, and typically how much does your backpack weigh? Oh, that is always a backpacker's question. We ask each other. It's like, show me yours, I'll show you mine. <laughs> um, they talk about the base weight of a pack, and that means the non-consumable things, your sleeping system, your cooking system, your backpack itself, the things that will be with you the whole trip. And that mine weighs in at about 15 to 16 pounds, which is lightweight compared to past years. It's not ultra light like some people, but I'm not an 18-year-old male who's willing to sleep on an eighth-inch thick foam pad on the ground. Um, and then once I add my food, which is a whole nother subject, and water, it can be 25 pounds. And, you know, this shoulder doesn't always appreciate it, but actually this last stint for a month on a trail, it actually made it stronger. So, yeah, about 25 pounds if you're carrying... Okay. Water. I can't. I cannot wait to get into the food and how you make this yeah. work uh, on on the trail, but not yet. No. So, so you, um, I still want to know. So you, you at one point you went from triathlons. If I think it was wait went from um, doing the marathons to triathlons and yeah. then biking. Is that right? Yeah, the biking has been a bit of a constant because that's what my best friend likes to do. Uh, yeah, I went from the marathons with some biking in there. And then my husband said he wanted to try triathlons. I thought, well, I'm not sitting at home. And so we did them. And after our first sprint, which is a short triathlon, he said, well, that was an the, here's the difference between us. One of the many uh, good differences, though. He said, well, that was a nice morning's exercise. I said, I'm going to do an Iron Man. <laughs> and that personifies our difference. I take it to extreme. And I did sign up for an Iron Man eventually, but got injured. But I got up to a half Iron Man. Yeah. But the cycling, um, we had the, uh, I had the good fortune. Actually, um, my best friend and I decided we wanted to bike across America. She'd already done it across the north with a group, but we wanted to do it just the two of us. Wow. So in 2010, we rode from San Diego to St. Augustine, Florida, about three, I think it's about 3,000 miles in 80, in uh, six weeks, averaged 80 miles a day. She made me do that much. I wouldn't have done that much. <laughs> wow. And it so was great. Wow. So do you recommend it? Oh, yes. If you want variety. Oh, my God. And and the panhandle of Florida, they call the other Florida. I mean, it's lush, green jungle stuff. And compare that to southwest Texas and Arizona. It was it was a great trip. Uh, I have to admit, we did not camp. I suggested it to her. She considered it for about two seconds. And so we got out the credit cards and stayed in beds every night. And so I, I think that I, I read that you stay in cheap hotels, motels, and there's a reason for that. What is that? Uh, when backpacking? Yes. yes uh, when backpacking. Because that's where you'll find the other hikers. Ah. I camp. I tend to hike for four or five days and then take what's called a zero day. Um, it, this is if I'm doing weeks or months. Uh, my short longest stint on a long trail has been 250 miles. My shortest, that was my shortest. My longest was 900 miles on the Appalachian trail. And so I know I need R and R time and I need time. I like to do my blog. Um, and so if I stay in the really, in the nice hotels, which adds up and gets expensive, um, I'm not going to see other hikers and I hike alone. I prefer hiking alone so that I can really feel the nature and not get caught up in the exercise because as you can tell, I can talk. <laughs> and so, but occasionally I do give in and stay at an embassy suite and enjoy right. all the clean whiteness. <laughs> so you like 
I, I find that. So when did you discover that you enjoy doing this by yourself as opposed to with a, a comrade, like the bike ride, you did the bike yeah. ride with your, with your best friend. Yeah. And, and, she, and, and that's a different, that's a different sport and it's a different feel, but yeah. And I feel like with that, we had one day we had 120 miles we had to do. Um, you don't have as many, uh, the Appalachian trail is well populated with other hikers. And you're never terribly far from a town, not terribly, as you would be on the Continental Divide Trail. Um, mm. So I think with bikes, things can go wrong. Our husbands were with us the first two weeks when we were in the desert in the yeah. West in case something happened. And we had to, we could change a tire and that was it. But for hiking alone, I think when... When we had the good fortune to live overseas for 18 years, and six of those years were in the Alps. I mean, can it be any better? No, for me. And I would, I remember one day hiking with a close friend there, and she was very personable, and she had a thousand more friends than I did there. And she said, oh, this was so much fun. We must bring the group here to do this <laughs> hike again. And I thought, I must come back alone. And not, I love the groups but I must come back alone so I can hear the birds, enjoy the streams and just soak it up. Is that where you developed your love for hiking was in the French Alps? That's where it really grew. As a child, I lived in uh, Creed, Colorado, a little mining town, and I just loved it. And in the future, I'll be hiking right through it. <clears throat> and, and I think that set the stage and played in the hills with my friends. But yeah, the Alps, it was right there. Wow. It, yeah. And uh, so I hiked them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you, you currently live in Ohio? Or where do you live? Cincinnati. Yeah. Cincinnati. And so, ergo, the, you hiking the Buckeye Trail. Right. I walked nine miles from my home uh, down to Eden Park on the Ohio River, where there's a big sign that says Southern Terminus of the Buckeye Trail. And I started and I've done half of it now. It's, it's a long-term project, four or five years, whenever um, I see there's a good stretch of weather. Because I was rained so, on so much on the Appalachian Trail during the four summers I did that. Um, I thought, I don't want to ever be rained on on the Buckeye Trail. And for that one, I self-support myself with a bike. So I really need good weather. I prefer not to bike. So I... I put my bike on a rack on the back of my our pickup truck and I will drive to wherever, okay, here's the stretch I'm going to do for a week. And I will drive ahead to where the finish point is for my first day. And I will lock my bike up to a fence or hide it in the woods and lock it to a tree. Or I've asked farmers if I can leave it locked to their trailer in their farmyard. Um, and then I drive back to my start, my trailhead. I walk on the trail. It might be a country road. It might be a trail. It might be a rail trail. And I walk to my bike about 12 to 14 miles that day. And then I get on my bike and ride back to the truck, put it on the rack, drive 30 miles to get to the next dest destination for the next day, and then find a place to camp or occasionally every third day I stay in a hotel so that I can recharge my bike because it's an e-bike. I bought an electric assist bike because sometimes I'm on country roads and I want to go fast uh, to not less chance of being hit. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that that's a really fun, completely different way to do it. Totally unlike the Appalachian Trail or the Florida Trail, which I'm in the process of doing now. Boy, you figure um, it out. Right? I, it's fun. It's part, I think... The physical and the mental challenges keep you young or make you feel older, depending <laughs> well, on the day. Well, I if like it's what, raining, you feel older. Well, I like what you said earlier, too, where you said you're not about excuses. You're about planning. Yeah. And, uh, and that's exemplified. And it sounds like everything that you do. Um, what is the, uh, the Buckeye Trail like? Is it shaded? Is it open? Is it hilly? Uh, I have no idea. Yeah, yeah the, the Buckeye Trail is 1,400 miles going around, kind of following the perimeter of the state, more or less. And you can go any direction, and it's a circle, and you can start anywhere. Um, I think that they've applied to be a National Scenic Trail. I'm not mm -hmm. sure. What I have seen of it, I've done all the west side and the north and bits of the east with a group, uh, but all the rest was solo. 
uh, going up the west side, it was a lot of rail trails um, and yeah. old canal paths following all the canals that connect Lake Erie to the Ohio River. Uh, going across the north, it's a lot of road walking uh, of m almost all just quiet country roads, though. And somebody said to me once, trails are wonderful because you get the nature and road walks are wonderful because you get the culture. And that oh, yeah. is exactly right. You see the farms. I, I love it. I really, it gets old at some point. By the afternoon, I, on the Buckeye Trail only, I might dip into my headphones and listen to a book on tape or listen to Plant Strong podcasts. I have several podcasts I follow regular, uh, regularly. But mostly I just get lost in my thoughts and look at the farmhouse and think if, it's, if that was my house, I'd put shutters on it. <laughs> so it, and, and if there's people in their yard, I speak to them and I'm invited to look at their garden. Uh, when I was hiking in Europe, I did, when we lived in France, I did, my first long distance trail was a 1500 mile trail called the GR5. Grand Rondone means big hike, big walk. And there's all sorts of GRs all over Europe. And it ran through five countries from the North Sea through the Netherlands, Belgium, Luxembourg, a bit of Switzerland and France, all the way down to the Mediterranean, to the to Nice. And I remember walking in Belgium once, I saw interesting, a man at the end of a darling little shady lane, um, working on his house. And I thought, I want to talk to him. So I dumped out my water and I walked up and I said in French, excuse me, would you mind refilling my water bottle? Because I wanted to talk to him. But back to Buckeye Trail. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is culture. Uh, the east is some southeast of Ohio, some kind times called Little Appalachia because yeah. it's it's hilly and uh, i've done some training down there in the shawnee state forest and that's where i took two friends to train for when they were going to join me in the appalachian trail and the trail was such good training for the appalachian trail so rugged uh that they said you know you're not ruth you're ruthless and that's my trail name ruthless now um so i look forward i've done some of it down to akron and it's uh, I just love the variety, the variety of Ohio. And we moved here with babies many years ago to Cincinnati, and I never really felt ownership of Ohio as a home. Mm. And this makes me feel much more so after yeah. all 42 years. Yeah. Because I've seen so many small towns I never knew existed, and many people don't. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, is there, so how many different trails would you say that you've been on since you've started hiking? Is it 20, 30, 40? I mean, do you have any idea? Um, well, you know, you can talk about a day hike. And so I do plenty around here, Germantown park, um, Miami whitewater park, uh, local state parks for long distance things. The first real one I did was the GR five in Europe. Since that time, my, my husband, also, before we lived in France, we lived in two other countries, and Japan was our first in 10 years. And while we lived there, we really explored all of Asia. And so we um, hiked in the Himalayas for five days with guides, porters who carry everything for you, even baked a cake on the trail. But we, were, we got to see Everest in the distance. Um, we trekked in in thailand uh bill and i since we've moved back to the u.s we have hiked uh for a week in patagonia with sierra club wow. um we climbed kilimanjaro Woo! that was good <laughs> 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 and uh we took the long route with sierra club again which i highly recommend led by one of their volunteers but they hire local guides a very personable in small groups. Uh, we took the long route, which was about six days up, five to six days, because then you acclimate very easily to the altitude difference. And um, and you see all the climatic zones longer. It, it was wonderful. Um, yeah, and then the Appalachian Trail, I tried to do it in two sections. People who do a whole a, a trail, no matter what its length, in one go are called through hikers. And 
almost everybody who wants to do the Appalachian Trail dreams of doing a through hike, which can be four to seven months long. Well, I knew I couldn't do that. So I tried to do it in two goes, but it ended up four times because of injuries, uh, tendonitis and stress fractures twice, twice I got them. Um, yeah. But I finished it. My husband promised he would help me finish it. And he came with me and <sighs> sorry, <laughs> that meant a lot to me. Yeah. Uh, he, no one can support me better than he does. Yeah. Um, well, it's, a, it's, and, it's so fantastic that, that he uh, encourages it and he allows you to uh, pursue this passion with, with such, uh, yep. ruthlessness. Exactly. Well, and you know, allows, we would use that word, but in the same way I allow him, yes. he is an amazing volunteer with youth throughout the community, our local community in Cincinnati and, um, the inner city. He does so much with habitat. He does so much and he's an active triathlete. He, I have to sing his praises. He's ranked as number one in his age group in Ohio. Um, so he's no slouch and he eats plant-based as well and he is no slouch. So yes, he is my main support. I'm just trying to think, um, Florida, the Buckeye trails, a work in progress. And then we didn't get to Florida trail just a week ago. I came home limping a little knee issue, but it's getting better every day. Um, the Florida trails, 1100 miles. If you do it from one end to the other. And it starts down in Big Cypress National Preserve down in the Everglades. And that is dynamite, crazy different. Walking in the swamps, for me, it took four days. Um, I'm slower and I take way too many pictures. Um, <laughs> and then it goes all the way up the eastern side of the state, but not on the coast, and turns left and goes across the panhandle and finishes near Pensacola. So my plan, I am not a through hiker as a to get back to the point, I am what's called a lasher. Now this is R rated. No PG rated. It's long ass section hiker. Uh -huh. it. <laughs> it's an acronym for that. And meaning I do long sections. So I did 350 miles according to plan this year. And next year I'll do my second third. And the third year I'll do my third third. And then just because it exists, I will go back on a fourth year and do something that's not part of the official Florida trail. I think it's called the Florida Keys Heritage Trail. Go from Big Cypress in the Everglades and go south and walk 200 miles to uh, Key West because it must be done. <laughs> wow. Uh, have you ever done any of the Pacific Crest or John Muir or any of those trails? No, but those they're calling my name, John Muir, especially, mm -hmm. um, Arizona trails calling my name because if you start in the South, right at the Mexican border and go up to Utah, Utah border, um, you know, the last bit is going down and up rim to rim on the apple on the, uh, Grand Canyon. So we'll see what the body allows. I'm 70 and I hope to have 20 more good years. And I feel like I can, as long as I, uh, pace myself just I mean, as I did in marathons. Yeah. Pace, pace yourself. myself you in the, years, it, daily, monthly, annually. Yeah. And make sure you're taking those rest days and rest weeks. Yes. You, know, you got to let the body recover for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. Ruth, I'm fascinated to understand how do you make this work with the food? I'm glad you asked. Yeah. So I know, I know that you're not about excuses. You're about planning. So how do you achieve this? All right. It was a learning curve. Um, I have a dehydrator, an Excalibur nine tray. It's a black box and it has nine trays that slide out down in my basement and it's humming most of the time. And I found a website called the backpacking chef and he has two fantastic recipes for adventure cookbooks and i learned the process how to do it and so but even though his isn't plant-based he does have a few plant-based recipes you can de i dehydrate all my snacks all my meals um it takes months but you can you don't have to have special recipes you can use your own and learn how to do it you either dehydrate the individual things like the peas the corn the potatoes the sweet potatoes and then put them together but then you need like a sauce or flavoring so 
often I will just make, oh, sweet potato chili, Sounders chili. I can't remember if it's yours or Jane's. Um, yeah. And I, I, my favorite cookbooks, you know, are Plant Strong, your, your red one. And I think, yeah, they're up there. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and the Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease uh, cookbook. Those are my two. And one of Chef AJ's. And I just cook these things and I spread them out on the tray and they take 10 hours or so. I'll go down midway and turn the trays so everything's even. I crumble it up. I put it in a Ziploc, uh, quart size Ziploc or pint size, and um, they keep forever. When COVID came, we had extra hiking food and I said, we are covered if this thing hangs around five years. We've got enough food <laughs> practically. And, for, and so I do oats and for my breakfast, uh, it's I put in uh, just rolled oats uncooked. Um, I love oriental sweet potatoes or any of the sweet potatoes. I, I cook I cook the vegetables and then I, I cut them up and I cook them and then I dehydrate them individually for that. I have riced cauliflower because according to your father's plan, we should be having um, greens or cruciferous vegetables or beets uh, four to six times a day. And I can do, I can pull off four times a day on the trail. Uh, six times is pretty hard. Uh, so I add sweet potatoes, um, riced cauliflower and zucchini to my oats, bananas, uh, the two tablespoons of flaxseed that he recommends, powdered vanilla, which I learned about from Chef AJ, the yeah. dynamite, yeah. and cinnamon, and little packets of in individual portions of bals balsamic vinegar that I add to it. Uh, he recommends the vinegar because that the acetic uh, acid explain yeah. it better than I can. It activates the nitrates yeah. and yeah. it helps expand the blood vessels. Yeah, and no, so that's my breakfast. It, it's a lumberjack size. I really, my bag weighs heavier than many people's because of all the food. One day's food weighs a pound and a half, but that is common. But I have to tell you, backpackers- A pound and a half, a pound and a half sounds like nothing to me, but then again, that's dehydrated, so you add in the water. And what, right. would that, what would that be if it wasn't dehydrated? Probably well, three well, and a half. Water four? is so heavy, yeah. three to four or five pounds. Oh, it'd yeah. be much more, much okay. more. Okay. Like I dehydrate mandarin oranges and fruit and make a fruit mix and just think of apples. All those things weigh so much. I was carrying on the Florida trail uh, towards the end, a, a friend very kindly gave me four baked potatoes because a new friend uh, called a trail angel, people who oh. help other hikers on the trail. He heard me one day as he was giving me some water along the way, say how much I miss baked potatoes. The next day he tracked me down. It was the road walk. He could find me there. Um, and he gave me four baked potatoes. And... Uh, wrapped in foil. And so I was carrying those. I thought, wow, those are heavy. But if they were dehydrated, I wouldn't have noticed putting them in. Right. Um, I also dehydrate my snacks. And one thing that I'm really proud of is I started with a basic, basic um, oatmeal cookie recipe from Chef AJ's book of just basically mashed ripe bananas and rolled oats. And that's it. And if you want to add some um, vanilla powder and uh, cinnamon, there you go. And then I thought, well, I could add zucchini. We make zucchini muffins and I could add carrots, both of them shredded. And now I've tried it with beets. Uh, and boy, those are red cookies. Ooh, <laughs> I bet. And I add chopped, uh, I, I don't eat nuts because of your father's guidance. So I add chopped cooked chickpeas and those are like my white mm. chocolate in it. Wow. And they're miniature meals. And I dehydrate them, and they're crispy like a thick cracker so that they will keep forever on the trail. And then I make a savory trail mix in which I have uh, chickpeas, I have mushrooms, which I love, and I marinate them for a while in balsamic vinegar and and pan fry them. And each one of these things is dehydrated individually. Red pepper strips, um, zucchini beet cubes, anything, and rolled oats. I try to get calories in there uh, because I burn 450 to 500 calories an hour. Wow. I, you can't keep up with it. 
No. I'm hungry after my lumberjack breakfast. Um, so I'm putting, I'm looking into that more. I'm going to put dehydrated quinoa in the future. I'm going to put a little more chickpea flour and things in my cookies just to get the calorie count up. Yeah. Uh, but I love my food. I love my food. I eat like a queen. I have three meals a day, big ones, and I have two snacks in the morning, two in the afternoon, if not three. And the way I prepare it, a lot of people, when they have dehydrated food, as I did initially, I used to eat paleo. I only finished my last quarter of the Appalachian Trail as a plant-based yeah. eater. Um, I used to put it in a little pot and put it on my little MSR stove with the gas canister, but then you have a mess to clean up and I just didn't like it. So now I do cold soaking where I put at for breakfast the night before I will put my oat mixture in my little plastic container with a lid and the water to cover it and more so. And in the morning it has soaked it up and it's ready to go. And so after I eat my breakfast, I will prepare my lunch, put it in my backpack. When I stop for lunch, it's ready. At lunch, I prepare my dinner, put it with water. It's ready. Now you're carrying that water, but you can either carry it in your water bottle yeah. or carry it with your food. It, and it, so that's that's it in a nutshell, except I can't well, eat nuts. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, now how many days worth of breakfast, lunches, and dinners are you typically carrying before you have to re resupply again? That is a very, very good question. Nobody really asked me that. What's most comfortable <laughs> is zero, but um, I like, my husband will mail it wherever I tell him, you know, and I always have my itinerary planned and I know where I can send it to a hostel or a hotel or general delivery at a post office. And so I will, I like best if I get it every three to four days. Uh, you also have to be able to fit it into your bear uh, proof container. I tend to use now what's called an ursac, and it's a big black bag that they have proven bears. They have different levels of them. I have the one that's called the almighty and little critters. We call them mini bears, M-I-N-I bears like raccoons and mice can't get in it, nor can bears. Now the bears will smash the heck out of the food but I don't care. I'll just add water to it and eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. I like it all. Yeah. Uh, so, and I can't really fit more than five days worth in there. Yeah. And then what you do when you camp, you tie it tightly to a tree and a bear may smash at it. But uh, if you keep your campsite clean and you don't leave food around, and if you camp in a place where other people don't normally camp, then the bears don't bother you. They don't mm. find you. Do you, um, do you have a particular um, make model of tent that you use and sleeping bag and all that jazz? All good questions. I love talking about this. The great thing about being with you, Rip, is I'm talking about two of my very favorite subjects, hiking and food. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this was on the Florida Trail. I just finished my first month on it. It was the maiden journey of my Durston uh, mid X one person, I think it's called something like that X mid. Um, and that's held up with hiking poles and it weighs just two pounds and it's wonderful. It has a net inner tent and then it's covered by, you know, a rainproof tent and it goes up very quickly. Before that, I used a tarp that I had sewn from a kit that I also loved. Uh, there's a Ray Jardine was one of the premier climbers and then wilderness instructors back, maybe we'll say in the 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, and he is also an aer uh, aeronautical engineer. And so he is a great designer and he designed these tarps and inside it is a bivy, a low tent mm -hmm. that slides in that is just net tending so the bugs won't get you. Yeah. And super lightweight. Again, two pounds like the Durston tent. And I made that and used it for the whole Appalachian Trail and other places. But I found in my plans this August, I hope to be doing Colorado Trail and I'm going to be above Timberline often. And, you know, a to hold a tarp up with... Uh, with uh, hiking poles is yeah. is tough 
And yeah. so I went this direction, but I will use my tarp again sometime. And my backpack is a ULA circuit, which is supremely comfortable. And it's not the lightest of light, which is the holy grail right now among hikers who are into speed hiking. Uh, but it is, it's about a little over two pounds and that's very good. My first one probably weighed five pounds in Europe. What, um, a, what about sleeping bag? Sleeping bag is called uh, UGQ, underground quilt. I think because they make quilts for hammock sleepers too. Um, and boy, I got it to where it's comfort level is 10 degrees because I sleep like an icicle and I'm willing to carry a little added weight to be warm. And yeah. I was sweating in it in Florida, wow. but I don't care. And a quilt is cool. It's very popular these days instead of a bag. You don't have the zipper. Uh, you're not as constricted, and you can open it. Like in Florida, I was hot, so I opened it up all the way, and I just have a blanket laying over me, and I can stick my feet out, and I got very – went along very Wait, wait, wait. So it was a quilt like a duvet that you just kind of put on top of yourself? Yeah, except it does have snaps and I can zip up the bottom uh, uh -huh. 18 inches to make a pocket for my feet. And if it's cold, it has snaps that you can do every now and then and draw strings on this UGQ bandit quilt nice. um, that really, it, it, it keeps you warm. What? You can make it almost like a sleeping bag, but yeah. it can also be like a duvet. Okay. What now, about, what about uh, hammock? Do you, do you hammock or no? Have you tried it? No, I no. just do my tent. Um, yeah. It's too complicated and there's more materials to carry uh, yeah. underground, you know, a under quilt, upper quilt. Mm -hmm. uh, but boy, they say once you sleep in one, you'll never go to the ground again. How about that? So what I don't want to be tempted by that. What about hiking boots or shoes, sneakers? What do you, what do you yeah. like to hike in? Um, I tried trail running shoes, which are very popular if you get a really good grippy Vibram, Vibram sole yeah. into it on the Appalachian Trail, but they wore down quickly yeah. and I got tendonitis. So I shied away from that on the rest of the AT. I wore Loa Renegade hiking boots, uh, which I love, but they are heavy and being waterproof, um, they stay heavy. And so now I'm using trail runners and they have the Vibram soles that just gripped in anything. And they're by a company called Topo or Topos. I think Tom Post, I think started it. It's online. You can buy some of them through some REIs and I am sold on those. Also, I use ultra lone peaks. Um, it's great because in, uh, the first four days and who knows when else you know, on the Florida trail, you're in water and I'm not going to, I can't do that with boots or slip into on the Appalachian trail. I would slip into my water shoes. I'm not going to do that over and over and over every day on the Florida trail. So I'm sold on these even for um, mountainous. But when we went to Patagonia and Kilimanjaro, they said boots, boots, and I trust boots. Yeah. They're good. I, They're good. So I, I was looking at your blog on your website yeah that is just i, I love it it makes me feel uh -huh. like i'm like there alongside you uh -huh. but i noticed i noticed because one of the things as i get older i really like want to keep my skin out of the sun as yeah. much as possible yeah um i just don't want to be a, a weathered prune right when i'm in my right. 70s and 80s and i never have that, surgery for melanoma yeah but yeah. i noticed you wore this really cool hat that had like this thing that came around like this and, and buckled up here. Yep. I want one of those. Can you tell me like what brand that is? And oh, what yeah. it's about? Outdoor yeah. research. Okay. Outdoor okay. research. I love their hats. Normally, normally I wear one that's just khaki colored, uh, but it was hunting season. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I had a rectangle on my back of, um, or bright, bright orange. This hat wasn't as bright as I'd hoped for, but yeah, it, it made all the difference in the world. And my shirt is SPF 50. I can't remember who it's made by yeah. I've worn it forever. And it's treated permanently for insects too. Insect do you like, do you like to wear shorts or long pants? Uh, long pants. I like to protect myself from ticks. I mean, when I did the AT up in the Northeast, that's like the mother, that's where mosquito or ticks, fly like salmons go upstream that's oh, where ticks no. like to go yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah no i i like but in 
on the Florida Trail, I tend to go with shorts because I'm in water more than grass. And I don't want to get my pants wet because if it's cold at night and it can get chilly there, I sleep in, um, I have special clothes just for sleeping. Uh, they're wool base layers and wool. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a bad vegan, <laughs> but I do it. Um, and so if it's really cold, I'll have my base layer on my legs and my upper body and I'll put my hiking clothes over it wow. just for another layer. So I don't want them wet. Well, tell me about, cause whenever I've, I've done a fair amount of hiking in my life as well. Um, I love that feeling after a long day of hiking, you eat and then you get settled down and you fall asleep between eight and eight 30. Yeah. Hikers you, midnight. Exactly. <laughs> Hikers midnight. I love that. Mm. What time do you like, do you sleep? I mean, do you get to sleep fast and then are you waking up at all? And then what time do you wake up when you decide to wake up and eat and get going? Oh, these are just so fun to answer. So fun. It depends on the trail. In an ideal world, um, I would have lots more sunlight than I did on the Florida Trail where the sun wasn't up till 7.15 and, and it went down, you know, before 6. Um, I would start, honestly, I would love to wake up and meditate, which I do at home for 20 to 30 minutes every day. But the trail's calling and other, if there's other hikers there leaving and you're going, yeah, 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 I got to get out there. Okay, meditate. I'm done. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and then I would follow it if I could with yoga, which I do sometimes. I love my yoga four, five times a week. Uh, but what I evolved to this time, since I had limited light hours and the insects will kill you, the mosquitoes go for you right at sunrise and sunset. Boy, you better be in your tent then. Um, so I would, I would honestly set my alarm for five because it takes me a long time to get yeah. to break camp. And I would eat my oatmeal as I'm packing up my tent. And I would be on, I was hiking towards the end by seven when the sun was coming up. And that's a magical hour. It's also a magical hour to do yoga at your campsite, but we make our choices. Right. Um, and then I would try to get into uh, camp by 4.30 or 5. And the key to cover, towards the end I was hiking well, I started with just seven to eight mile days because I was walking in the swamp and I couldn't do more than that. And there were designated high, dry places to camp. Towards the end, it was a lot of road walking in Florida because the Florida Trail has been called a series of beautiful pearls held together by brown twine. Oh. Uh, you can't have Disneyland every day or beaches every day. You know, <laughs> you... It, it, in any state, there's less than scenic areas and they're tying it all together as best they can. Yeah. So I knew I had a lot of miles to cover. I got up to 20 miles a day a couple times and you don't go faster. You just give yourself more time to do it. Yeah. And that way, hopefully you can avoid injury. Who's the most um, in interesting um, person you've run into during your hikes? Oh gosh. Honestly, it was on this hike. I'm going to tear up because this guy was so sweet. I'm passing a hiker and you seldom pass them on the Florida trail. It's not like the AT. And he's a young man with um, maybe in his thirties and he's wearing a crucifix and he's got kind of an old fashioned rucksack on his back and we're sharing our stories. And he's a young father when he was in church, he was a devout Catholic. When he was in church, he, he had a, the hair on his arms went up rose and he felt the strong presence of a being beside him. And he said, I knew it was St. Joseph and St. Joseph said to me, your son is on his way to you and I will play a pivotal part in his life. And his son was not conceived yet, but 10 months later he was born. Uh -huh. And when they did the sonogram, they said it, you know, we'll tell you what it is. He said, I know it's a boy. And it was 50-50 odds. <laughs> but so he was hiking just a few days, the old fashioned way. And he had a 14th century uh, uh, Latin prayer book uh, transcribed into English. And he was saying prayers. It was all devoted to his five week old son, uh, just for his life. He's healthy. He's fine. It was it was mm. a he was a pilgrim in honor of his son and his future, and he 
said that he was training to become a Jesuit of some level. I don't know, you know, married. I don't, I know he was married. Um, and he was so dear. And as we parted, he held my hand and said a prayer for us, for me, for safety on the trail. And mm. a real true pilgrim. You know, so many people want to go do the Camino in Spain. And that's admirable. And I want to do that in my 80s. <laughs> <laughs> But this guy was, this was a true pilgrim. Wow. What, yeah. what, what's the hardest moment you've ever had on all your, all your hikes that you can remember? It was my hardest. And at the risk of blowing my own horn, I'll, it was my best. Um, Isn't that funny how that's usually the way it is? Yeah, it is. It really, really is. Um, I was hiking from the center. It's called a flip-flop hike. And I did the... I did the AT as a flip-flop where you start in the center or wherever you wish and go to one end and come back to the center and go to the other. So I started in the center in 20, let's see, I wrote it down, 2017 at Harper's Ferry, West Virginia. And I did the southern half in two summers, two big chunks, five, 500 miles and then 600 miles. And then in 19, I came back. And I was going to do all the north. I went to Harper's Ferry. I went north. I got 900 miles. I wanted to get a, a little over 1,100. But I just, I needed, I hadn't gotten to 900 yet. And I met a, a Swiss couple. And she was hiking with him. But she was going to go home soon to babysit grandchildren in Switzerland. And so I met him after she had left. And he was just so desolate and so lonely. And he didn't want to have to go home because he'd done that before out of loneliness. And he had maybe a couple hundred English words in him. But luckily, my master's is in teaching English as a second language. So I'm very comfortable with it. And I've lived overseas 18 years. So we fist bumped. We agreed to climb, do the rest of the AT together and climb Katahdin together. And he said, and Wait, so what, 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 what year was this? This was in 17. I hiked Seven. 17, okay. 2017, 18, so, 19. So you're hiking yeah. with this guy, even though you like be hiking alone. Yes. Okay. And so is that because I, I needed him as much as he needed me. I was oh, starting to get after 900 miles, it's getting old. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I'm a lasher, not a through hiker. Yeah. Um, I prefer to keep it new and go home when it gets tiring. Yeah. Uh, not physically tiring, but you're no longer enjoying it. Yeah. And so I did hike with him and he, he would have gone for longer miles, longer days, but he did not, he adjusted for me. And, but gradually I just, my hips hurt so much. Um, I didn't know what was wrong and little did I know it was the stress fractures. So finally, one day I just sat in the middle of the trail and cried my eyes out. And I said, I cannot go on. I cannot go on. And he just, he couldn't console me, but he could say my name, Ruth Morley, Ruth Morley. And so we stagger out the four miles and get a ride to the hostel we were going to stay at. But I kept thinking, I promised him. So I said, his trail name was Freeman. I said, Freeman, I'm going to Katahdin with you, but you are hiking and I'm going to rent a SUV and I'm going to support you the remaining 220 miles and you will get there. And so I did that. And it was the best thing. It was my best experience of the AT. He did not want to camp anymore. He was tired of all that. So we got out the credit cards and yeah. I booked it. I could book it. I had fluent English. I'd get hostels. I'd get hotels. His wife was happy. He had me. My husband was happy. I had him. It was great. It was great. And then um, at, once he got to Katahdin, I said, I've been sitting in this car for three weeks. I can climb Katahdin with you, the final yeah. mountain. And we climbed it. And I came down, I kissed the ground, that's in my podcast, in my blog, Yeah. and went home to crutches. <laughs> I did have stress fractures still, but I made it, I did it. And that meant more to me than you'll ever know. Wow. And yeah, and the equal billing is my husband saying, if I, a after that stress fracture, I said, I'm not going back. He said, you only have one tenth of the Appalachian Trail left. I said, no, I'm not going back. And he said, he swallowed deeply. And he said, I will do the 100 mile wilderness, the last part, which is still very difficult and Katahdin with you, if you will go back. 
Within two weeks, I'm making my itinerary. <laughs> uh, and when I closed that gap and I got to the base of Katahdin, and I'd now done every foot of the AT, it was, I told him, I said, I may hike solo, but I didn't do this alone mm -hmm. because he mails me all my food. Yeah. Team yeah. effort, team effort. Oh yeah. Wow. That's, thank you for sharing that story. That's really beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Ruth, what is next for you? When you come back on the podcast in a year, in a year, what what will we hopefully hear from you as far as uh, a, a hike that you have, you're wanting to do? Oh yeah. Well, I will have done the second third of the Florida Trail, which goes through Ocala. I think it's state or national park. I'm not sure that everybody says is absolutely beautiful. I'm so excited to see more of. Florida. It's magnificent. And in August, late July, I'm going to start the Colorado Trail, which is, um, I get my number 480 miles and it starts in Denver and it goes southwest all through seven ranges of the Rockies. I mean, there's mm. minor ranges, um, Sangre de Cristo and others like that. Um, and it goes southwest to Durango, which is down by the four corners. Um, and I hope to be able to do all 480. I'm going to pace myself. I've got altitude. I'll be up at um, 13,000 feet for days and days. Um, and if I stop halfway at a town called Salida and then come back, I'm a lasher. That's what I do. I will let my body decide. Um, yeah. But they say never stop on a bad day, like on a rainy day. And yeah. you stop if you're hurting. I, I respect my body too much to people continue on broken bones. No, I don't want, no, I don't want pain to be part of my memory yeah. of this. That's why I got off three days early this time because my knee was saying you're done now. And I said, okay, <laughs> so that's what it'll be. And after that, I don't, I don't know. I mean, Buckeye trail, I, that's, those are pretty good plans. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Any interest in, Ever setting foot on the Appalachian Trail again? Um, well, you know, now that you mention it, I have something that's tickling around in the back of my head, but I don't know if I'll do it. Um, there's something called the Eastern Continental Trail, mm -hmm. which goes from Key West all the way up to Quebec. I'm tempted, since I plan on walking to Key West, to just fill in the gap between the Florida Trail in the north and Springer Mountain, the southern part of the Appalachian Trail. It involves about 750 miles. I, I'm just guessing. Those who know better probably know the right answer. But it would be hiking in Alabama, a lot of road walks, and then the Pinhoti Trail and the Benton Mackay Trail, and that connects you to Springer Mountain. And then I would have to flip all the way up to Maine and go from the base of Katahdin to, I want to just get to the Canadian border and be able to say to myself, I walked from the Canadian border to Key West. Wow. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if it's worth 200 miles of road yeah. walking. Yeah. Ruth, what would you say... What advice would you give to somebody that's out there? They're sitting at home. They're hearing about you and all your adventures. And how would you inspire them to get off the chair, get off the sofa and do something that seems scary? You know, that's one reason, one of the many reasons I like a blog. I get questions like that. And I love it's just as you say, you are ambassadors for this way of life. That's what I, I want to be. I want to really help people eat better and move more, like Dean Ornish says. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be. I mean, mine's extreme, and I didn't plan on extreme. It just, these desires burn in me, and I just it all builds on itself. But if you live in an area with parks, make it your goal to walk every trail in every park. Now, again, that's extreme. Make, make it your goal to find all the parks in your city or town. Get outside. And when I've had my, my stress fractures twice and on crutches, I couldn't even leave the house. And I finally found a great counselor and I took some, at my request, antidepressants for a while. And I've been off now for quite a while. Um, being outside is some of the best medicine you can oh, have. Oh, oh my God. I'm in love therapy. with trees. Best therapy ever. 
<laughs> it is the best. Oh, oh, look, we went, I'm going to show you a sign. We went to something called the Sign Museum here in Cincinnati today with get family. Look at this. Hiking is cheaper than therapy. Perfect. There we go. There you go. Yes, it is so good. Just move. And mm -hmm. there's a great quote. Let me, let me think. I love quotes. They always inspire me. Um, yeah. It's just something about, I'm very short mood follows action. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mood follows action. You yeah. just don't make excuses, make plans. Yeah, I make, love it. Yeah. Ruth, Ruth, um, our time has come to a close, but I want to mm. say thank you so much for this therapy session. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think that you, I know you've inspired me and I'm sure you've inspired just about everybody that's heard your story, you are just so passionate mm -hmm. and you are living, I think, the life that many of us in, in many ways wish that we could, but for whatever reason, we're not. And I think that you are a testament to what's stopping you, get out there, start, and there's no telling, you know, what kind of hurdles you're overcome. Oh. Um, but you know, and you're doing it all plant strong. I love Absolutely. it. I love it. Somebody asked me on the trail. He said, what impact do you think? Uh, what, what, how much credit do you give the food that you eat? The hikers were very interested. They were yeah. much more interested than the general population. Very interested in what I ate. And I, I told him everything. Um, I, he said, what credit do you give your food? And I said, 95%. <laughs> uh, I have hiked all those marathons, uh, run all those marathons, biked across the U.S., all these things, despite how my body felt. My hips hurt since I was in my 40s. My hips always hurt. And now I do these things because of how my body feels. I love I, I love that quote. I, yeah. usually, I actually wrote it down, too, because I wanted to say it yeah. uh, at some point. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, and and the number, you know, I was almost happy to turn 70 in December, be almost, <laughs> because just to be an example, yeah. uh, age is, they say is only a number, not necessarily. I mean, I admit I'm getting older and I say I feel 20 years younger than I am, but who knows? Uh, changes happen. Changes happen. Happily, wrinkles don't hurt. That's yes, good. That's, that's good. <laughs> but we try to be the best we can at the age we're at. Yes. And yeah. that's what I try to do Yeah, for my own pleasure. Yeah. Ruth, this has been an absolute pleasure. Uh, thank you. I also want to thank your, your partner, Bill, for all of his support, allowing you to oh. pursue. I shouldn't say allowing, but giving you the gift yeah. of, of <laughs> pursuing yeah. your passion. You know, how, how remarkable Oh, uh, no. not all, not all of us have that luxury. So that's really what a gift. Oh, it's the truth. It's the yeah. truth. I'm yeah. still lucky 50 years together. Yeah. So Ruth, do me a favor. Keep it plan strong. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Sir. It's been great. Thank you. Ruth is always open to answering questions and I can't wait to have her back on the plan strong podcast to hear about her next set of adventures. She does have a blog, and I'll be sure to link that up in the show notes for today. And until then, make plans, ditch the excuses, and always keep it plan strong. Thank you for listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.